Hello and welcome to the Friday, February 10th, 2017 edition of the Sands and its Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Filippo Valserda identified an interesting vulnerability in F5 Big IP virtual servers. The vulnerability is a little bit similar to what we had with Heartbleed, which is why Filippo called this one Ticket Bleed. It only affects fairly specific configurations that enable session tickets for these devices. With session tickets enabled, it's faster for a client to reestablish an SL connection. The client will just send a session ID and a session ticket. The server will then echo the session ID back and well, that's where the problem happens. The session ID is usually 32 bytes in length, but a client may send a smaller session ID. If that happens, the affected devices will still reply with 32 bytes, padding the remaining bytes that this client did not provide with random memory. So maximum number of bytes it can be leaked is 31 because the client has to provide at least one byte, it's not 64K as we had with Heartbleed. Also, the number of vulnerable devices, it's much smaller. With Heartbleed, we had like millions of vulnerable devices. Here, the number is more in the thousands. F5 did publish an advisory with an exact list of all the vulnerable devices. If you are affected, there's a pretty simple fix. You can turn off the session ticket feature. And uh, with that, you may incur a little bit of higher CPU load, but uh, really that only affects uh, resuming connections. So overall, it's probably not all that significant. Also, this is not in any way related to OpenSSL. Uh, this only affects the proprietary TLS stack that F5 uses. And if you wonder what your users clicked on the last couple days, uh, Brad wrote up a pair of real uh, nice uh, diaries uh, with uh, some recent malware. First one is a Crypto Shield, a Crypto Ransomware, of course, that's being distributed by the RIC Exploit Kit. In order to be exposed to the RIC exploit kit, a user has to visit a compromised website that will then redirect the user to the site actually hosting the exploit kit. The exploit kit will only be delivered if a user arrives with the right refer. So if you're going directly to the site hosting the exploit kit, you may actually not see what's happening. Also, the domain names are highly volatile for this particular campaign, so it makes it difficult to do any meaningful blacklisting there. Uh, Brad did notice that IP addresses keep repeating there and as usual you'll find his PCAP files and the like if you would like uh, to analyze uh, this traffic yourself. The second incident that Brad wrote up uh, talks about Hankitor and Pony. A uh, Pony is just a downloader, so uh, you will have it uh, download additional uh, malware. It is uh, distributed via malicious email and uh, the user will click on the link, then it's being exposed uh, to a Word document that uses the Hankitor malware to then install Pony. I do see a lot of Pony downloaders uh, these days, so that's certainly one of the big ways how then the final malware will actually make it onto the system. The malware distributed uh, by these campaigns is uh, very flexible. You'll probably end up with the usual crypto ransomware or something along these lines in the end. Pretty much all mobile devices will sync to some kind of cloud account unless you specifically disable that for iOS devices, that's of course Apple's iCloud. Elcomsoft, a company that specializes in mobile device forensics, in particular for iOS, uh, now discovered that deleted Safari browser history values are retained in iCloud well after the user deleted them from their browser. So a user may think that they are safe, that they deleted an incriminating history from their browser, but uh, if someone actually recovers a backup uh, from the iCloud, uh, they'll be able to recover all of these deleted history values. Apple addressed this issue now, so it shouldn't be a problem anymore, but uh, up to then they retained up to a year's worth of browser history data. 
The flip side of this, of course, is if you do forensics investigations on mobile devices, you should not overlook these online backups. After all, that's sort of the point of it, that you can recover files or data that was deleted from the device itself. And talking about forensics and encryption, Lux, which is the Linux Unified Key Setup, is a popular way to encrypt Linux partitions, in particular things like USB keys. There's a neat blog that walks you through the brute forcing of the hashed password that's used to secure these Lux devices. You could, of course, brute force it by trying to sort of enter passwords, but it's rather slow. With the method uh, outlined here in this block, uh, what you do is you actually extract the hashed password from RAM and then uh, just uh, brute force the hash, which of course tends to be faster than brute forcing the password against a live device. So this is not about a vulnerability in Lux. This is really just about making brute forcing Lux passwords more efficient. Well, that is it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.